With a strong growing economy, the future should be bright for 57 million school students in Indonesia. But the education system here, rife with poor teaching and corruption, came last in a global report measuring schooling standards. If we were given the chance to learn more specific, I think we would be better than this. We're lacking modern techniques to engage uh, students to have that willingness to study. I think that's the problem. A new curriculum is being introduced to simplify learning across a nation where one in three elementary students drop out. But moral-based subjects are being prioritised over science in a controversial overhaul of education. National identity is on top of everything because this country was born to become Indonesia. And I think education in Indonesia needs to make the students to love their country. Through science, actually, you can create values. If we don't have enough scientists by 2030, where will Indonesia be in the global economy, in the global world? Andrew Ambrose, on this edition of 101 East, we go inside the classrooms and ask what is needed to improve education standards for Indonesia's school children. In a rural area, the best way to share the benefit of education is by sending an example of a product of education. After two to three months of his presence, people realize the benefit of education. It's why he can solve any problem confronted to him. He can explain the world. We invited the best to teach. These are people that have world-class competence. These are people who have every opportunity to have a good career, and they choose to be in the village where there is no electricity, there's no running water, there is no phone signals. Indonesia tercinta. Faisal Jamal rarely traveled outside his hometown Jakarta before being sent to the remote volcanic island of Sumbawa. He volunteers for Indonesia Mengaja, a program where university graduates spend a year teaching in remote poor schools. The 23-year-old electronics engineer lives in a small village called Tambora. It's unreachable by car and eight hours from the nearest airport. When I joined Indonesia Mangaja, I knew I would have to live in a remote town. But when I found out it was on the slopes of a volcano, wow, I knew this was going to be a once-in-a-lifetime experience. My parents didn't agree with my decision to leave my office job and salary, and they asked, what am I going to do afterwards? But Faisal says teaching his grade three and four class at the primary school is a fulfilling experience. Today, his class are learning about public speaking. To overcome nerves, every student is made to feel like a movie star. When Faisal arrived here seven months ago, he was surprised by the basic living conditions and limited electricity. He concedes children in Indonesia's big cities get a better education. They have a lot to catch up on, but they are enthusiastic and they work hard. I'm certain they can be competitive. 
mereka bahkan belum tahu it's my job to inspire them so they don't drop out of school Faisal engages his students by teaching them practical knowledge on their environment outside the classroom. Pupils like Yusika Irawati are big fans. He teaches everything, Indonesian, mathematics and other subjects. I always do my homework and follow what we learn from him. We're happy when he teaches us. Impian kamu menjadi apa? Jadi guru. I want to be a teacher too, so I can teach first and second grade kids. I'd like to teach mathematics. Senang matematika? Iya. Across this sprawling archipelago, there's an elementary school in every village and city district. But only 11% of Indonesians attend university like Faisal. Primary school education is free and compulsory throughout Indonesia. But according to World Bank figures, enrolment rates in rural and remote parts of the archipelago are well below 60%. Hey, anak anak, kita ke mana? Okay, ayo, mari kita berjalan. Nationwide, one in three students drop out after elementary school. Bertemu dengan hewan-hewan. It's a long walk to school. When it rains, there's a risk of falling trees or being attacked by a wild pig. Some have to stay at home and work on the farm. If they don't, where will their food come from? Faisal is one of 70 volunteers given training and survival skills, then stationed in remote towns across the archipelago. The corporate-sponsored Indonesia Mangaja program was founded by Anis Baswedan, the dean of Paramedina University in Jakarta. Let's look at the, the challenge in the teacher issue. We have enough teachers, but the distribution is unequal. In the remote areas, 66% of our school don't have enough teachers. And number two is quality. The quality is not that good. Even seven-year-old Yusika sees that problem. At Tambora, only two of the four teachers turn up to work, and they have only completed high school education. Compared to other teachers, Mr. Faisal always comes, and he is always here. Some of the other teachers, they rarely come. Faisal often has to help the other two teachers with their lessons. Low wages force many teachers to work second jobs. The small size or condition of classrooms doesn't matter. The fact is, teacher attendance is at a minimum. Only one or two come. They have rigid teaching methods. Sometimes they don't pay attention to the students. And I can't turn a blind eye. From rural areas to the cities, Class sizes in Indonesia are smaller than advanced countries like the United Kingdom and South Korea. The problem is only 51% of teachers in Indonesia have proper qualifications. 17-year-old Artika Nuswani Gram will graduate this year from an inner-city government high school. She says many of her teachers are regimented in their style. I don't think that the ways of teaching in here are like of uh, sophisticated enough, I, I think it's like still a little bit old fashioned. Even that not all of teachers are able to use computer, that's what happens in Indonesia in general. I think if the teachers are as developed as teachers, let's just say in Australia or in Singapore, Malaysia, we would have a better quality. Artika also believes a clogged school curriculum makes learning difficult. She studies 17 separate subjects in one year. Uh, biology, math, physics, chemistry, Bahasa Indonesia, English, Bahasa Germany, and then we do have history. What else? Uh, uh, oh, yeah. Wait. 
She dreams of becoming a diplomat or working in the UN Security Council. But she feels her education has been quantity, not quality. Indonesia is very versatile in like many things, but not really an expert of a particular things. Maybe one of the reasons is that because we learn all of the subjects. Last year, Indonesia came last in a landmark global education report by the Economist Intelligence Unit. It ranked 40 countries on knowledge comprehension, teaching standards, graduation rates and other key benchmarks. Even though Indonesia spends 20% of its national budget on schools, Education Minister Mohamed Nur says many studies have highlighted a struggling education system. We're using this report to improve our curriculum and analyze why we are at the bottom. Indonesia is not isolated. We are part of the global community and we have to compete with the rest of the world. We'll see changes in the next five to ten years. One big change on the horizon is more value-based subjects like nationalism when the new curriculum is introduced in July. It's not narrow nationalism or about loving your country. We want to build Indonesia's identity. Artika says she finds her nationalism class worthwhile. We learn about government systems and then we learn about our history. When we graduate, we will work in this kind of society that we have to know like what our nation is trying to achieve, what our nation is struggling for. Leading education expert Arif Rahman is considered a moderate voice here. He supports another new measure increasing religious education from two to four hours a week. Number one is to believe in God. That is number one. Nothing else. I think it is very important for them to have a spiritual power. I will not call you an Indonesian if you do not believe in God. I will not call you an Indonesian if you don't have any humanistic feeling, justice, you know nationalistic and democracy and social justice. That is the most important thing. Other moderate leaders like Anis believe allowing more time to study values is more important for a country plagued by graft, bullying and schoolyard violence. Education is producing people with good characters, especially integrity. We have to combat corruptions and corruptions is symptoms of lack of integrity. Once you have someone with full integrity, then knowledge will come along. But this new shift towards values involves cutting science and social studies subjects. Both will be integrated into Indonesian language classes through elementary school and possibly some high school levels. Students like Artika are not so sure it's a good idea. She is majoring in biology. I don't really know how it would work if we like combine science with uh, linguistics. I think that would that would conf that would be confusing for us for for the students because like how how could you be focused to learn both in the same times? That would make us a lot more confused than now. In a global study of 14-year-old school students. Indonesia received an F in science. Their score put them behind Southeast Asian nations as well as Palestine, Iran and Syria. The basics of math and science itself, once it's feared at an elementary level, you're lost. If we don't get that level of understanding of students already involved in science since their early years, you're going you're gonna to have a setback. And that means if you're dependent on foreign technology, you're letting the foreign companies come in, take over the, the building of natural resources for their own purposes and exporting it back here. And where does that make us in terms of global economy? Sri Setiawati Saifal is from the Surya Institute, 
a science education organisation working with the government to develop the curriculum. The institute says 70% of science content will be lost if it's integrated into Indonesian classes and could deter students. You cannot be just a good, humble, highly honest person without knowing anything about a subject that you learn because that would just make you into just a nice person. And this country needs leaders. They need people who understand their subjects, who understand the values of creating an economy based on the advances you make in science and technology. The glitzy new shops and malls around Jakarta reflect Indonesia's reputation as an economy on the move. But the nation's success rides on a commodity boom and credit card fueled domestic consumption. Not the innovation-based industries or large-skill workforce that China or India has. Knowledge-based subjects are extremely important. We have about two to two and a half million uh, people going into the labour force every year in Indonesia. Big, big number. That's half of Singapore going into the workforce every year. What we're facing right now is, is that the talent pool in terms of the demand and supply is not in equilibrium. The supply is not really keeping pace with the demand. Tigor Siahan is the first Indonesian to serve as Citibank's country director. The investment banker and father believes the country's global competitiveness in the Asian century lies in a more considered education system. I think it's crucial um, for uh, the education system to, to ensure that the uh, knowledge-based system is actually uh, handled with care. We're trying to create leaders and we've got to look at all aspects of the education system to ensure that a graduate will be able to compete not only uh, against uh, all the other Indonesians out there, but also in the global system uh, that we're facing today. <laughs> Indonesian Mangajar's Anis Baswedan is just one of 20,000 Indonesians to hold a PhD from a 242 million strong population. To boost higher education figures, the government has changed the school curriculum twice in less than a decade. Our curriculum have, have, has been going uh, through uh, quite a few changes. What's the impact? Not much. So I'm not against change of curriculum. I think uh, we need to always update the curriculum. But what we must understand is that this is not the key to the current problem we are facing. One big problem is poor infrastructure. Despite significant state funding, more than 150,000 classrooms across Indonesia are in urgent need of repair. This village school near Bogor, on the main island of Java, was only renovated in 2008. But last month, structural weaknesses and heavy downpours led to this. We can't go inside because the classroom has been declared a crime scene. But through the windows, you can see the entire ceiling has collapsed onto children's desks and chairs. 34 children and a teacher were injured the latest in a long string of accidents in classrooms across the nation. I'm here with Siti Juliantari from Indonesian Corruption Watch, who is investigating these incidents. Many Indonesian schools have had their roof collapse, like we're seeing here, because building materials don't meet basic standards because the education funds are being misused by corrupt schools, education department officials, and contractors who supply poor building materials. It's not just a lack of transparency in providing goods and services for education. The corruption watchdog estimates 40 to 50% of school funds are siphoned off through graft and embezzlement before it reaches schools. The small amount of actual funding has created a culture of bribery and under-the-table fees. Uh, contohnya adalah 
Even though their operational costs are covered by the government, schools charge parents with illegal overhead fees for registration, extra lessons, excursions and exams. Parents also bribe teachers to admit their children because of the lack of good schools. Five years ago, Heru Narsono was told he had to pay an expensive donation for his daughter to attend a public elementary school in Jakarta. We demanded transparency. We reported it to the National Audit Agency and they estimate the school was misusing $450,000. The auditors also found the school was receiving sufficient funding from state and national governments to operate. As a result of his whistleblowing, Heru's daughter Punotti was excluded from certain lessons and school activities. If we don't pay up, it affects our children. They were discriminated against and intimidated by the police, school teachers and other parents. When our daughter was in the third grade in front of everyone, she was told she was a poor kid. If she can't afford to go to school here, she better study under a bridge. The school principal, who is the main suspect in the Graf case, has since died. Today, Panotti is in grade six at the same school. People ask us why we didn't move our daughter to another school. But she was blacklisted to enter other state schools in the area. Education may be free in theory, but bribery and added fees discourage poor families from sending their children to school. Even though Indonesia has increased its education budget, more than half gets tangled up in 18 government ministries and bureaucratic training programs that critics say don't improve schools. The increase in education funding only happened three years ago. The public want to see immediate results better education results. But those results will take time. We only started fixing basic infrastructure like schools since 2011. For students like Artika and Yusika to achieve their dreams, Indonesia needs competent teachers, a balanced curriculum and proper distribution of its large budget for schools. But it will take more than the government to fix education in the world's fourth largest country. It's not only the government that must organize, energize and do something. Much of the middle class in Jakarta is sending their kids to private schools. Therefore, they know nothing about public education. The middle class of Indonesia is huge and the middle class of Indonesia can serve as an inspiration to those uh, who are still in schools that I want to be like them. And if they get involved, the impact is big. My hope is to inspire these kids so my time here isn't wasted. With motivation, even if they live on the slopes of a mountain, with limited supplies of electricity, anything is possible. It's going to be hard to let them go and go back to Jakarta, because I found a new family here and a new hometown I deeply care about. Often when they come back to the cities, back after surfing, they cannot forget that place. The city life is not as ideal as uh, how the community lives in that little village. But I often mention to them, if you stay in that village for 20 years, the impact you have is only in that village. With the capacity you have, come to the policy makers. You can help not only one, two village, but you can change in a larger scale come back, do something, but don't forget the experience you get in that village and don't forget your children. <laughs>